There are two kinds of light bulbs in this room. Uh, one are these fluorescent light bulbs here. And the other is inside that projector. And that is an incandescent light bulb. What's the difference? Yes. One is burning and one is fluorescent, which is why they call that one a fluorescent bulb and that one is called incandescent. And incand incandescent means, well, not quite burning. It's not burning because it's not consuming oxygen. But why does it give off heat? No, light. Why does that give off light? What makes an incandescent light bulb glow? Yes, yes, it's hot in there. That's why. There's a little metal wire in there, and we run a lot of electricity through that wire, and that makes the wire hot. Why does running electricity through a metal wire make it hot? Resistance. Good word. What's resistance? Why does running electricity through a resistive metal wire make the metal wire hot? Well, what is heat? What does it mean to be heat? Heat is energy, yes, but what kind of energy? It's a very specific kind of energy. Friction is, is a force that causes heat. What is heat? What does it mean when something is hot? It's moving. That is the answer. Heat is movement. It is the movement of molecules, and in particular, the vibration of those molecules. If I rub my hands together, the reason they get hot is because I am causing the molecules in my hand, they're bumping into each other. They're banging into each other and that causes them to vibrate and that vibration spreads through my skin and they're all vibrating more and more and that's what heat is. So apparently when I run electricity through a wire, it makes the molecules in that wire vibrate. Now why would that be? Well, the electrons that I'm pumping through the wire are hopping from atom to atom to atom, but they don't hop perfectly. It requires a little kick to get them to hop, and that little kick gets translated into the atoms, and they all kind of shake as the electrons are moving around, and the wire gets hot. Fine. Why does it glow? Why do hot things glow? <coughs> Pardon me. You are glowing right now in infrared. Your body temperature is high enough for you to emit a rather large amount of radiation, which you cannot see, but cameras can see it, which is why soldiers have those things and they can see you know, people in the dark and shoot them. Right? We can see infrared radiation. We cannot see infrared radiation, but we can detect it. You are emitting rather large quantities of it. A normal human being is emitting several hundred watts worth of, elect of, of infrared radiation, generally at any given time. So you are all little light bulbs that are glowing. But why is that a different color of light? How come that's white light coming off of there as opposed to infrared light? And why is it that a hot piece of metal, as it gets hotter, will start to glow red? and then yellow as it gets hotter and hotter, and then eventually white. What, what causes that? Why does temperature change the color of the light being emitted? And yes, I am going to get to the topic soon, but I want to finish this. <laughs> so what is light? Well, light is electromagnetic radiation. Now, what does that mean? Electromagnetic radiation. If I take a charged particle, an electron, I'll hold it between my fingers here because I have a superpower. I'm going to hold this electron and I'm going to wiggle it. And what happens to the electric field around that electron as I wiggle it? Well, little waves of electric field will, will propagate away from the electron as I wiggle it. You know, if I had another electron here, if I wiggled this one, this one would start wiggling too. Why? Well, because as I moved it, it would repel that one and then I pulled it back, it would come back. And that f influence travels in a wave. Electromagnetic waves, which are light, are simply the motion of electric particles. And when you get a bunch of atoms vibrating, well, they're all made of charged particles. And so those charged particles emit electromagnetic waves, which is light. Hot things glow because they're made of charged particles that are moving, and that creates electromagnetic waves that propagate away from them. That's the entire reason why hot things glow. 
And that's why you glow. And that's why the universe glows. Why does that glow? It's an entirely different thing. Completely different process, which I don't have time to go into. So, <laughs> the talk I'm going to do tonight is called The Scribe's Oath. I have it in my pocket here. Hmm. The Scribe's Oath. This is going to be a talk which will take us into the deep past, very th thousands of years into the deep past, and then it will take us into our own past, our own past uh, of programmers and IT, and we will use that past to try and project where we are headed into the future. And I will leave you with a prediction and a possible solution to the dilemmas that we face. Scribes. In the deep dark past, thousands of years ago, literacy, the ability to read and write, was confined to a small group of people called scribes. One of the reasons it was confined was that most people didn't have to know how to read and write because they were working in the fields or they were hauling bricks up pyramids or they were rowing boats or something like that. There was no need for them to invest the immense amount of time required to learn this arcane business of scribbling symbols on papyrus to record information. On the other hand, civilization cannot exist without some kind of record keepers. Someone needs to write down rules and laws. More importantly, someone has to write down business transactions. And these people were the scribes. And the scribes were an elite class of people. The scribes wore special clothing to denote their status as a scribe. They lived in special places because only the scribes would live there. They sent their children to scribe schools to learn the art of literacy, to read and write. These people copied, there were no Xerox machines, they copied books, they copied records, they took dictation. People, important people would speak and the scribes would write it down. They codified laws. Laws would be spoken by kings and rulers. The scribes would write the laws. Do you think maybe the scribes wrote the laws the way they wanted them to be? Oh no, sir, you actually said this. I can read it to you. The scribes kept records. The scribes could calculate. They knew how to do math. They could do accounting. Imagine how important these people were. You could not do anything without scribes. Nothing of a high civilization. Nothing happened in ancient civilization without scribes. Not laws, not commerce, not wars, nothing. Had to have scribes. The scribes were a lubricant to society. They made things work because of their ability to keep records. They allowed laws to propagate. They allowed history to be accumulated. They allowed commerce records to be recorded. They were the, the oil that made the society work. They also knew many languages. They knew more than one language because languages were fairly isolated in, in geographical terms. So scribes would be able to take from one language and translate into another. They were polyglots. They knew multiple languages and multiple writing styles. They had special writing styles for short dictation, different writing styles for laws, different writing styles for commerce. They were elite. If you were a scribe, in Egypt, for example, you mostly lived in court. You were so important that you lived roughly where the pharaoh lived, close to the pharaoh. Or if you were in one of the outlying communities, you would live where the ruler of that community lived or very nearby. You would be inside the walls that protected the most important rulers. You were never to be conscripted. You could not be drafted into the military. Your labor could never be conscripted by some other powerful being. You were protected by your particular patron. You were not required to do labor. 
lifting bricks, planting fields. You are a scribe. Your fingers need to be protected. And I like this one in particular. In Egypt, scribes were not required to pay taxes. <laughs> I think they wrote that law in themselves. <laughs> but I like that law. A little bit later, I'm going to come back to that law. But not just yet. The scribes were the middle managers, the scrum masters, if you will, the people who understood how to make teams work. They were the, the ones that rulers went to and said, I need X to happen, and the scribes would figure out a way to make this happen. They were trained from youth to be a scribe. It was an inherited position. Because of this, there was a lot of culture involved with the scribes. They had their own special handshakes and their own special clothing and their own special greetings and so on. They also had things of more substance. They were disciplined. They had particular disciplines when it came to their own skills. They had standards that they would not compromise. And they had an ethics that they would not breach. And everyone understood that this had to be the case because if you did not trust the scribes, civilization would end. So the scribes held to a very high degree of trustworthiness. A scribe was a professional, perhaps one of the first. To give you an idea of just how disciplined these people were, I, I did a little of research on Hebrew scribes. There were lots of different kinds of scribes. But Hebrew scribes were very interesting. One of their jobs was to copy the Torah or copy the, the, the Holy Writ, the, the scriptures. And here's a, uh, a, just an example of the kinds of ritual that they went through. First of all, they would write on animal skins only because animal skins were long-lived. But they had an entire process for cleaning those skins and stretching those skins so that the skins would all be the same by the time they started writing on them. And it was a long, ar arduous process. They also had a special ritual for using those skins to bind the material, the books and the scrolls that they were making. When they wrote, and this is really interesting, they would write on a skin but they would write never more than 60 lines down. Could be a little less, but not much less. And uh, between, actually between 60 and 48. The number of lines had to be between 60 and 48, which I find fascinating. We have similar rules today in, in certain things. They always used a black ink that had a very special recipe that we don't have anymore. The recipe is now lost, but they had a very particular recipe. They made their own ink. As they wrote, they verbalized every word that they wrote. They did not write silently. Every word was spoken out loud as they wrote it on a skin. If they had to write the name of God, which was four letters, which are equivalent nowadays to YHWH. Some people pronounce this Jehovah, other people pronounce it Yahweh. Y-H-W-H. If they were about to write this word, they had to clean the pen, they had to use a brand new clean pen, then they had to wash their body, you cannot write the name of God with a dirty body, then they would write the four letters and continue on. A document once produced, being a copy of a previous document, had to be reviewed within 30 days. So someone else had to take the old document and compare it to the new document within a 30-day period. And they had a particular review process. No more than three pages, no matter how big the document was, and those documents could have been 40 or 50 pages, no more than three pages could contain an error. If any more than three pages contained an error, the entire document was not destroyed, but it was filed in the error bin, and the, doc the copy would have to be redone. So they held themselves to an extremely high standard. They would count the number of letters in the original and compare that to the number of letters in the final. 
had to be exact. They would count the number of words in the original, compare that to the number of words in the final. That count had to be exact. They would count the number of paragraphs in the original and compare that to the number of paragraphs in the final. You can imagine why they're doing this. Did someone forget a space? Did someone forget a line, a blank line? Paragraphs, words, they're making sure that the separations are all still there. No two letters could touch. There had to be a gap between every letters. There could be no ink bridging those letters. The middle paragraph had to be the same as the original document. The middle word had to be the same as the original document. The middle letter had to be the same as the original document. These were checksums. Very creative and specific purpose checksums used by the reviewer to make sure that the document was correct. Then, of course, they were only stored in special places. Uh, that's fortunate for us because the Dead Sea Scrolls were, were found in one of those special places. And so we have these documents that are 2,000 years old, and I think we learned a lot from them. And they could never be destroyed. They could only be buried. But you're not allowed to destroy them. Uh, sort of like Git. <laughs> Now that was the scribe back then. But we are, interestingly, faced with a very similar situation today, because you and I are scribes of a different kind. We have a literacy, a literacy of the computer. We know how to read and write code. This is not a common ability. Most people do not need to know how to read and write code. They live their lives just fine not reading and writing code, and they're perfectly happy not reading and writing code. And when we get excited about code and try and show it to them, they close down. No, don't show me that. So we are scribes. We know this particular language or group of languages. And, oddly, civilization does not exist without us. A point that I will make later. But before I do, let's go back in time. Back in time to the very first real programmer, 1948. And now I'm not talking about Ada Lovelace and I'm not talking about Charles Babbage. I'm talking about the first person to write a program on an electronic stored program computer, a program that you and I would recognize today as code. Although he wrote it in base 32, and wasn't symbolic in any sense, although still he wrote what we would consider now to be code, instructions written into the memory of a computer that that computer then executed. The man's name was Alan Turing, you probably know that. The computer he did this on was built not too far from here. In 1948, it was called the Automated Computing Engine. It was one of the very first computers ever built, possibly the first. 1948, how many years ago was that? Okay, you can all do the math. Do, 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 do. 68. Did I get that math right? Did I do the subtraction correctly? 68 years? I think it's 68. Almost seven decades. Seven decades ago, the number of programmers in the world was what? Now, that's less than a person's lifetime. And in less than a person's lifetime, how many programmers are there today? More than a million, probably much more than a million. It depends on if you count the VBA programmers. <laughs> but probably the number is in the hundreds of millions. How do you get from one to hundreds of millions in seven decades? This can't be linear growth. It's impossible that that would be linear growth. It must have been some kind of exponential growth. And if it's exponential growth, then it must have a doubling time. What is the doubling time? How often does the population of programmers double? And you can do the math. And you can search out the history as well. And what you will find is that very roughly, the population of programmers doubles every five years. Now think about that. Every five years, there are twice as many programmers as there were the five years before. Every five years, the number of programmers in the world doubles. 
This implies something very troubling. Half the programmers in the world have less than five years experience. And this is always true. As long as we are doubling at a rate of five years, half the programmers in the world must have less than five years experience, which puts our industry in a state of perpetual inexperience. We cannot gain a large group of experienced people compared to the very large group of inexperienced people. We cannot win that race. Most industries do. Most industries eventually accumulate a large group of very experienced people who can guide the less experienced people. Our industry cannot, simply because of its wild growth. This wild growth often leads people to believe that software is a young person's game. Old people leave it. We didn't leave. We're all still here. There just weren't very many of us to begin with. It also means this, the mistakes that I made 30, 40 years ago will have to be made by you because there's no one to stop those mistakes from getting made again and again and again. There aren't enough senior people to prevent the cascade of error that we have experienced over the last 70 years. This is a deep problem for our industry. But Let's go forward in time from 1948 to the 1960s. Who were programmers in the 1960s? How many were there? If you use the doubling scheme, you'd think, well, gosh, uh, in the 1960s, there probably weren't more than somewhere between 10 and 100,000 programmers in the world, which means that nobody knew one. There weren't any living next door to you, right? Because if you dilute the population of the world down to hundreds of thousands, you can scatter programmers with vast distances in between them. So most people had no idea what a programmer was. You use the word programmer in 1962 and they go, what? And the word software didn't exist. Programmer? Computer programmer. Oh, yeah. If you were interested in computers in the 1960s in school, you got beat up. Right? Oh, you're a geek. Beat them up. You got to cure them. So it was not a great time for me because I was interested in computers roughly around the year 1964 when I learned a little bit about Boolean algebra and I learned a little bit about languages like COBOL and PL1 and Fortran and I managed to get a little book on PDP-8s and learn assembly language by 1968-ish time frame. Wasn't a great time for me because I was a geek. I was a nerd. I was one of those kids in school that everybody else think, eh. And every once in a while they'd beat me up. I learned martial arts. By the way, that works. <laughs> 1970s, 10 years. 10 years on, how many programmers are there? Well, if we follow this doubling thing, there's probably a half million. That seems about right. Half a million, maybe a million, something like that. There's a lot of programmers by 1970. And by this time, you started to see television commercials about computer programmers. I remember one in particular where um, it was, uh, do you guys know who Mrs. Olson is? You know who Mrs. Olson, the Folgers Coffee, Mrs. Olson would, would talk, oh yes, oh my goodness. The poor housewife, I can't make my husband a good cup of coffee. And Mrs. Olson would say, the problem is you're using the wrong coffee. You, use, you have to use Folgers. It's the most aromatic blend. So there was one particular commercial where the, uh, the woman, the housewife, was trying to select Folgers coffee from the, from the shelf. And a computer programmer, he was named as a computer programmer with a calculator and glasses and a pocket protector with pens in it, was doing the math saying, no, it's too expensive. And Mrs. Olson walked up and said, oh, but it's the most aromatic blend. That was just that commercial, so sorry. In the 1970s, we were weirdos. We were, um, oh, we were playing Pong. Anybody remember Pong in the bars, right? These strange, bizarre games that were electronic. They had TV sets in them, and you turn knobs, and you could sort of boop, 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 play ping, ping pong. 80s. In the 80s, how many, com how many programmers were there in the world? Eh, probably two to three million. Maybe a little more than that. Maybe four million. A lot of programmers in the 80s. And we had a pretty good 
image. We ate Twinkies. Everybody knew we ate Twinkies, and we were kind of weird. But people began to recognize that this was a good career. The idea of being a computer programmer meant that you were probably going to make a lot of money. You'd have a good career, you'd be pretty well set for the rest of your life, it's a good career path, probably you could get into management within five years, take over some company and be filthy rich. So it was a good career path to get into in the 80s, and we saw lots of people entering the, um, the domain during that time. In the 90s, we saw programmers become villains. Does anybody remember Jurassic Park? Dennis Nidri, the programmer, the Twinkie-eating weirdo who was also evil. We, programmers, had graduated to the point where Hollywood could reliably represent us to the world at large, not just as these oddballs, but we could be villains. We were significant enough to become true villains and be credible at it. People could believe, yeah, these programmers could really screw us over. That was an interesting moment. That was the 90s. How many programmers are there in the 90s? 10, 12, 15 million, maybe? Lots of programmers by then. Then came the 2000s. By this time, programmer was a household world, word. Probably most people knew at least one, probably knew more than one. They would live down the road from you. They'd be around. You'd run into them at a party and, and hear, oh, my God, that guy's a programmer. Well, OK, cool. Well, I know some other programmers, too. Hmm. We um, began to see programs like uh, the Big Bang Theory, where the, the, the geeks, they weren't necessarily programmers, although they talk a lot about programming on that show. Um, they were kind of cuddly heroes, sort of, that you wouldn't necessarily want to know, but you do like to watch. The Matrix came out in this time frame. And a programmer was not only a hero, he was a savior. He was a demigod. And does anybody remember a horrible show called um, The Net with Sandra Bullock, right? Where the programmers were all working for the NSA or something like that. We had graduated to the point, so well known, that we could reliably be evil, we could reliably be cuddly, we could reliably be saviors. And people would understand, oh yeah, programmers, they're really powerful. They could build a matrix. I was at a bar in Amsterdam in, 19, in 2015, 14, something like that. I had visited the, um, the Mojang folks, Minecraft. Um, how many programmers were there in the world? By this time, hundreds of millions. I was sitting outside after I'd been lecturing them. And I was sitting outside at a uh, beer garden in Amsterdam. We were just outside drinking. We were surrounded by a hedge, but people could see over the hedge. And a little kid runs up and out of the blue points at one of the Mojang programmers and says, are you Jeb? Now, Jeb was the Twitter name for one of the programmers at Mo Yang, who happens to have red, striking red hair, and he's very recognizable. And his Twitter avatar shows an image of him that is pretty recognizable. So this kid tears up. Are you Jeb? He was an American kid, too. American black kid. Right? Didn't live in Amsterdam. Are you Jeb? And Jeb says, yeah, I'm Jeb. Oh, can I have your autograph? Programmers have become childhood heroes. Imagine that. From geeks that got beat up to what our children aspire to become. That is how programmers have changed their image over the last 70, 60 years. But that was not the coup de grace. The coup de grace occurred last year when the CEO of Volkswagen America testified before Congress and told the Congress of the United States of America that Volkswagen had violated the environmental protection rules because of a couple of programmers for whatever reason. 
to quote him. And he didn't quite pull it off, because I think everybody went, uh huh. But he tried. He tried to pull it off. He tried to turn us into the scapegoats, the evil underneath, the ones who had done the dirty deed. And in fact, in that regard, he was right. Because it was some programmers who wrote that code. Now, maybe it wasn't for whatever reason. Maybe they were told to write that code, that lying, cheating code. But they wrote it. And you and I should feel offended by them. That they would write code that lied and cheated. You and I should take the view of the ancient scribes and say to ourselves, we cannot have that amongst our ranks. We cannot have programmers who lie and cheat in their code. Because if we allow that, no one will ever trust us again. In some sense, that was the final arrival. We arrived. We became the scribes. We became the indispensable people whom the world better trust. Because if they don't trust us, they're going to have to do something else, and we're not going to like it. Software is a kind of literacy, as I said before, and we are the elites of that literacy. Nothing happens in our society nowadays without software. How often does your grandmother interact with software every day? I'll tell you, it's probably on a minute-by-minute -minute basis because there's not much she can do in her house or outside at the store or anywhere else without interacting with the software system. You can't buy anything without interacting with the software system. You can't sell anything. You can't drive your car. You can't use a taxi. You can't use the phone. You can't turn on the microwave oven. You can't wash dishes. You can't wash your clothes. You can't do anything without interacting with a software system of some kind. How much software is in this room running at the moment? And forget all the laptops and smartphones. In the walls of this room, how much software is running? In the ceiling, how much software is running? Look at these, these things hanging there. What are they, microphones? You think there's software in there? Who wants to bet? There's software in there. You know why there's software in there? It's cheaper nowadays to put a little digital signal processor with a C algorithm doing fast Fourier transforms than it is to put an inductor and a capacitor in there to filter out 50-cycle hum. It's just cheaper. So yeah, there's some code written in that thing, written at 2 in the morning by some 22-year-old geek. <laughs> right? And that's okay with me because he's not going to hurt me. But the ones out there in the cars, how much software is in a modern car? Anybody know? And not a Tesla. A Tesla's just over the top. <laughs> a normal, modern car. How much software? 100 million lines of code. 100 million lines of code in a normal car. And most of that code is in the entertainment center and in the GPS receiver, and you don't need to count that. But there is code that controls the engine. And the connection between the engine and the accelerator pedal used to be a hard link. You used to stretch a cable when you pushed on that accelerator and it would twist the little valve in the carburetor. But nowadays, you push on that accelerator pedal and there's a little A to D converter that converts that to a signal that a little computer picks up and goes, oh, he's pushing on the accelerator. And then it tells the fuel injectors to inject more fuel. There's software in there interpreting your foot pressure on the accelerator. Oh, and on the brake. There is software interpreting your foot pressure on the brake. There is software, you don't want to know this, there is software interpreting your pressure on the steering wheel. The steering wheel is still a hard linkage in most cars, although most cars, most very modern cars nowadays have little servo motors that can turn the steering wheel itself. My wife has a car, it's just a regular old Jeep, nothing really too fancy, but it has a front looking camera and that camera can see the lane markings on the road. And if it sees that you're between the lanes, it turns on a little green light on the dashboard. You're between the lanes. Right? Now, if you drift across the lane marking, it will turn a little, little green light yellow. Say, hey, you're drifting across the lane markings. If you continue to drift, it will yank the steering wheel back. The software controls the steering wheel. This should scare the hell out of you. 
Because who wrote that code? Who wrote that code? And what was their process? And do they have tests? Did they write tests? Did they pair on it? For God's sake, it's controlling the steering wheel. How many people have been killed by cars? The software in cars. And the number is in, in the dozens right now. There have been cars that have just completely lost their minds uh, from a computer's point of view, where the computer says, oh, I need to put the accelerator down and not let him touch the brake. <laughs> and these cars would accelerate out of control and smash into things. And the number of people killed by incidents like that is well above 10. It's in the dozens. And the number of people injured is well above 100. There have been fairly large lawsuits paid out over these kinds of issues. You and I have to face something. We are killing people. We did not get into this business to kill people. We got into this business because we wrote a little program in BASIC once that printed our name a million times and we thought that was cool. <laughs> but here we are. We are in a business that is now killing people. This puts us into an interesting position because we rule the world. Other people think they rule the world. They hand the rules to us. We then write the rules that actually execute. And everything in our civilization is handled this way. We write the rules. We rule the world. And with that, I'd like to get back to this whole idea of no taxes. <laughs> I think we have a certain amount of leverage there. Right? If we all banded together and say, no more code until no taxes, I think we'd win that one. I do. We rule the world. We are the modern day scribes. Nothing happens in our society without us. We are the lubricant that makes the civilization work. But where's the discipline? Those ancient scribes developed a discipline and an ethics morality, a set of standards. Where is that? Do we have that? The answer to that is no. We do not have the discipline. We do not have the ethics. We do not have moral standards. None of us rose up in righteous indignation when those two Volkswagen, was it two? Whatever those guys, it Volkswagen broke the rules. We just kind of went, yeah, programmers will do that sometimes. No. Programmers will not do that sometimes. We as a industry, as a profession, are going to have to start deciding some things. We're going to have to decide what our ethics is, what our moral standards are. We're going to have to draw a line that no one can cross, no matter what. No employer can make us cross it, no matter what. And these, these, these things need to be known and they need to be loud. We need to establish disciplines that we all follow. Yes, it's been a wonderful 70 years where every programmer did whatever the hell they wanted. Those days have to come to an end. We need to establish some hard disciplines and hard standards that we all follow. And there's a reason we have to do this. We cannot call ourselves professionals without doing that. Because all professionals have that. All professionals have a set of standards, a set of ethics. In fact, that's what you expect from a prof professional. You expect a professional will have a set of moral standards that protect you from the power that they wield. Lawyers. You expect that lawyers have some kind of ethics. I know that's hard to believe, but you kind of expect that lawyers have a certain ethics that protect you from the immense power they have in their access to the legal system. You expect doctors to have an ethics that will protect you from their immense power to diddle around with your insides. And the world expects us to have a set of standards that protects them from the immense power that we wield over this civilization. No one quite gets this yet. We don't quite get this yet. The world doesn't quite get this yet. But it's not far away when the world does get it. I thought the world would get it on October 1st, 2013. And this may not mean so much to you as it means to me, but that was the day that healthcare.gov in the United States was turned on. The law, the, the healthcare law that has been so controversial in the United States. That law was duly passed by Congress, 
signed into law by the President of the United States. It said something ridiculous. It said that a certain software system had to be online on October 1st, 2013. It's stupid for a law to say something like that. Stupid for anybody to say something like that. This software system will be working on that date. Ha, 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 ha. You don't know anything about software, do you? No. But something interesting happened on October 1st, 2013. They turned it on. Now, there had to be guys, programmers, sitting in the back, hiding under their desks going, oh, they turned it on, didn't they? They really shouldn't have turned it on. This is not ready. But those programmers didn't stand up and say, you can't turn it on yet. None of them ran out to the newspapers and said, they shouldn't turn it on. Don't log in. Don't log in. All of your secure information will be available to hackers if you log in. They didn't say those things. And it, of course, it was a disaster. It was a debacle and very nearly derailed the law. The law could have gone down. It was just a hair's breadth. The law could have gone down because of programmers. I thought we were going to see the change then, and it almost happened for a very brief period. The President of the United States considered making the CTO a cabinet-level position. We could have had a secretary of software. And I see some wide eyes in the room, and yes, that is the right reaction, because what in hell would that person do? <laughs> it was not healthcare.gov that caused the change, but something will. Someday, some poor programmer, hopefully not in this room, but some poor programmer is going to do some dumb thing, and it might not even be that dumb. And 10,000 people will die. And you can imagine the scenario. You know, what could cause 10,000 people to die? Oh, you know, some kind of aircraft accident or cruise ship accident or nuclear reactor accident. Some kind of bizarre accident that will be traced down to some poor schmuck of a programmer who put a plus sign where he should have put a minus sign and 10,000 people die. And when this happens, and it will happen, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. When this happens, the politicians of the world will rise up in righteous indignation, as they should, and they will point their fingers squarely at us. Oh, they might go to the managers first, but then the managers will say, it was the software developers who did it for whatever reason. And the finger will wind up pointing right at us, as it should, frankly, because it was our fingers on the keyboard. It was our code that did this. And the politicians of the world will ask us the question. And it's a simple question. How could you have let this happen? And we'd better have an answer for him. If our answer is, well, you know, my boss told me I had to do it, that is not going to cut it. And the politicians of the world will then do the only thing they can do, the only thing they're not even very good at doing, they will pass laws. They will regulate us. We will become a regulated industry. They will tell us what languages we should use, what frameworks we should use, what platforms we should use, what machines we should use, what processes we have to follow, what signatures we have to get, what books we have to read, what courses we have to take. And all of this will become a matter of law. And that would be deeply, deeply unfortunate. How can we avoid it? Well, the way we avoid that is getting there first. This is what doctors did. Doctors knew this was coming back in the 1700s, 1600s, whenever. And doctors began to establish ethics and law, ethics and rules and standards. They came up with a body of people who could point to someone and say, that person is a doctor, that person is not a doctor. They could eject you from the ranks of doctor if you broke the rules. Lawyers did the same thing. Other professions did the same thing. They had a way of establishing rules and ethics. They had a way of enforcing those rules and ethics. We're going to probably have to do that too because that's the only way we're going to avoid those rules being imposed upon us by the world. So we can get there first. We can say, these are the rules, these are the standards, these are how we, how we enforce them. And then when the disaster occurs, because the disaster will occur, 
And the politicians point their finger at us and say, how could you have let this happen? We can say this was an accident because look, here are the standards we enforce. These are the disciplines that we all adhere to. This is how we enforce those things. This accident was not due to our negligence. And right now we could not say that because it would be due to our negligence. So what would a set of standards like this look like? I'm going to recite for you something I call the programmer's oath. Something that I think captures at least the minimum of what you and I should promise as professional programmers. And you may disagree with some of this and you may agree with some of it. This is simply considered a first draft. I'm not going to try and force it on you. I don't have that kind of authority, but I do want you to consider it. In order to defend and preserve the honor of the profession of computer programmers, keep that one in mind. It is an honorable society that we should belong to, and we should do what we can to preserve that honor. I promise that, one, I will not produce harmful code. I left it this vague because I, fig I feel that it is probably each individual that will have to determine what harmful means until, of course, a, bo course a board of inquiry is set up. You know, if, some, if somebody violates the rules of the EPA, a board of inquiry could be put up and say, well, those programmers wrote harmful code. You're not programmers anymore. That would be interesting. But number one, you promise you will not write harmful code. Harmful. Harmful to what? Well, that probably means it doesn't have defects. Does code have defects? Programming programs always have defects? Are defects like normal? Do we always expect code to have defects? Why did we ever start thinking that? When did it become acceptable to release code with defects? Nowadays, we do it as a matter of course. People will just put up code on the internet and say, this is an alpha. If you use it, it'll probably crash, but go ahead and try. When did that become acceptable? When did that become honorable? It clearly isn't. It's clearly careless. I will not produce harmful code. Harmful to what? Harmful to my users. I will not produce code that is harmful to my employer. I will not produce code that is harmful to my fellow programmers. How many of you have been slowed down by bad code? Significantly slowed down by bad code. That code harmed you. It harmed your employer. It harmed your users. I will not write harmful code. It covers a very large amount of ground. You write code, you have to remember that that code is going to affect everyone who ever sees it whether they are a programmer, whether they are a user, anyone who experiences the result of that code, your code will affect them and you cannot do harm to them. Which means that you're going to have to have a high degree of integrity about this code that you are writing. And you say to yourself, yeah, but I've got deadlines. There's nothing in here about deadlines. Nothing in here about promising to meet a deadline. By the way, promising to meet a deadline is stupid. Because you cannot promise you cannot keep that promise. You may get lucky, but there's no way you can promise to meet a deadline. You can try. That's about the only thing you can do. And even that doesn't work very well. Two, the code that I produce will always be my best work. Anybody ever release code that was not their best work? Ever release code that you knew, eh, this is kind of iffy, but the date's here, I'm going to ship it. It's a dishonorable thing to do. I will not knowingly release code that is defective either in behavior or in structure. Meaning that it is not defective in what it does, knowingly. It is not defective in what it does. But it is also not defective in how it is formed, what its structure is. It does not damage the design or architecture of the system. 
It does not contravene the rules that everyone else expects. It does not damage the behavior or the structure of the system. Three, I will provide with each release a quick, sure, and repeatable proof that every element of the code works. This is a fascinating promise. I, will, I promise with every bit of code I release to have accompanying it a quick, sure, and repeatable proof that the code works it is supposed to. Imagine someone who is not a programmer hearing that. And they might go, well, of course. You mean you don't? <laughs> Imagine your employer, who knows nothing about software, hearing that. And going, wait, you mean they're not? Well, then how does it work? They don't know either. The idea of supplying a proof that your software does what it is supposed to do is so obvious, and yet it's completely absent from what most of us do. I like the words quick, sure, and repeatable. I should be able to demonstrate to anyone on a moment's notice that my code works. The code I wrote works. Someone comes to me and challenges me and says, what about this scenario? Bam. I should be able to demonstrate works for that scenario. And I should be able to do that over and over and over again. And I should be able to do it at 30,000 feet over the Atlantic, sipping a gin and tonic. Four. I will make frequent small releases. I will not impede progress. How do you impede progress? By holding the code out. By preventing other people from accessing it. From not releasing it quick enough. I will make frequent releases. I will release the code often. I will let other people into it often. I will not hold it as mine. Does anybody uh, remember old so source code control systems? When somebody could check out a module, prevent you from getting at it, and then they'd go on vacation. <laughs> You know, and you'd have to break all the rules and unlock it, and, and then you'd have to modify yourself, and then there'd be this horrible merge at the end, and the guy would come back from vacation and say, what'd you mess with my code? For? Well, you know, we had a bug. I don't want any of that. I don't even want that to last for a day. Quick releases. Less than a day long. I will fearlessly and relentlessly improve the code at every opportunity and will never make it worse. This should also be obvious. Humans make things better over time, at least in theory. Humans improve things over time. The house you live in should be getting better and better, not worse and worse. The car you're driving should be getting cleaner and cleaner and better maintained. Everything you touch, everything that is yours, you should be improving over time. That's what humans are at least able to do. And that should be true of our software as well. Your software should be getting better and better with time. The system you are working with should not be rotting and degrading. It should be getting better. The design of the system should be getting better with time. The structure of the system should be getting better than time. with time. The performance of the system should be getting better with time, of course. You know, code rots. Anybody seen code that is rotted over time? It is not biological material. It does not rot by itself. People rot it. We rot it. The actions that we perform cause the rot. But by the same token, our actions could reverse the rot. Six. I will keep productivity high. I will do nothing that decreases productivity. That's an interesting one. I'm not going to do anything that decreases productivity. I'm going to keep productivity high. How do I do that? What do I do to keep productivity high? Well, that goes into the code again. I can't write bad code because that would slow down productivity. Uh, I can't create defects. That would slow down productivity. Uh, I need to maintain a good test suite because that will increase productivity. 
Uh, I'm going to have to make quick releases. That'll make increased productivity. I should communicate outwards to everybody the structure of my code. I should train people on what the code I've written does. So that'll increase productivity. I will increase productivity. I will do nothing that decreases it. I will continuously ensure that others can cover for me and that I can cover for them. Fascinating one. I will ensure that others can cover for me. What does that mean? Is there a guy on your team, if he goes down, the whole product is toast? Do you have like Bill the database guy? Yeah. Or Jim the gooey guy? And if he goes down for some reason, oh man, what do we do? Nobody knows the database. Nobody knows the gooey. This is not acceptable. And by the way, if you are that guy, it is your responsibility to make sure that other people can cover for you. If you are the only guy who knows the database, you've got to train somebody else. You are being irresponsible in holding that information to yourself. You're being unprofessional. And if you are someone else on the team and you don't know the database, you should go to that guy and say, hey, teach me the database. Anybody should be able to step in. No one should be indispensable. We should be able to cover for each other. You know, we make a lot of hullabaloo about teams, software teams. Do you know how teams behave? You got a bunch of guys trying to get a ball down the field. One of those guys goes down. What do the other guys do during that play? They cover that position. They have to cover that position. They're still trying to get the ball down the road. We, down the field, we have to be able to cover for each other if we want to call ourselves a team. Teams cover for each other. A guy on board ship has a job, but there's somebody else on board ship that knows that guy's job. For obvious reasons, people go down on board ship, and you don't want the whole ship to go down. We cover for each other by teaching each other, by learning from each other. There are ways of doing this. I won't belabor you with the ways, but I want you to think about the fact that you need to make sure that somebody else knows what you're doing, just in case you go down. Eight, I will produce estimates that are honest both in magnitude and precision. I will not make promises without certainty. I will make, I will produce estimates that are honest in both magnitude and precision. What's the difference between those two things, magnitude and precision? I can get this job done in 10 months. That would be magnitude. I will get this job done on January 1st at 3.16 p.m. That would be precision. I will make estimates that are accurate in both magnitude and precision. How can you do that? How can you do that? How can you estimate in both magnitude and precision. And there's a simple way. You have to recognize that the magnitude you can get sort of right, and the precision you're going to be completely lost at. So I can accomplish this by giving my employers three numbers. And they ask me, how long is it going to take you to do X? Oh, X, that's a tough one. Hmm. Probably it will take me four days, probably. But if everything goes perfectly, you know, I eat the right breakfast cereal every day, and I don't get into a fight with my wife, and all my coworkers are really polite to me, and there aren't any meetings or stupid things I have to do, I could probably get it done in three days. But if everything goes wrong, short of nuclear war, it might take me 10. Now that's a very interesting estimate. It's a very honest estimate because it provides this envelope of probability. And the way we do this in a formal terms is we say we use the 95% confidence bars. We say we have a 95% confidence that if everything goes right, three days. And we have a 95% confidence that if everything goes wrong, 10 days. And in the middle, mm, four days. That would be an interesting estimate to make. And what you are communicating then to your employers or your stakeholders 
is, uh, I don't know. I don't know how long it's going to take, but it's going to probably, between these two bars, I think I can probably get it done during that. And they will come back at you and say, that's not good enough. I need a number. Give me a number. And you have to say, I don't have a number. Because here's where you have to get honest. And the honesty is you don't know. You don't know. You can't tell them, oh yeah, I'll get this done by Friday. Don't worry about it. You can't say that. So you have to be honest about your level of uncertainty. And they're not going to like it. They want you to be certain. Of course they want you to be certain. They want to eliminate as much variability as they can. And you cannot let them badger you into reducing your uncertainty. You have to make sure you communicate it properly. And some of the tricks they will use to make you feel guilty and say you're not a team player and all of this, but the last one they'll do is this one. They'll look you square in the eye. There's guys in the room who have probably done this. Right? They'll look you in the room and they'll say, well, will you at least try? And the answer to that is, how dare you imply that I am not trying? By what right do you look me in the eye and accuse me of not trying. I have been trying this whole time. There's no magic beans in my pocket. There's no magic ring on my finger. I cannot alter reality. I have told you what my level of uncertainty is. By the way, you probably shouldn't use those words. <laughs> you might want to soften it a little bit, but your internal reaction should be that one. It should be outrage because it sounds so reasonable. I'm so real. Well, you at least try. It's a manipulation. And you should realize that's a manipulation. You're being manipulated. You're being manipulated to give a commitment. And that's something you should never do. Here's the bottom line of this oath. I will make no promise without certainty. You can promise things, but only if you're certain. If you're not certain, then what you must communicate is the level of your uncertainty. Nine, I will never stop learning and improving my craft. We are not laborers. We do not learn our trade and then practice our trade the same way for the rest of our lives. We are a profession, and a profession that is growing and becoming ever more intricate and complicated. We have to keep learning, and we have to keep learning at a rate that is equivalent to the kind of learning that doctors and lawyers have to do to keep up with what their skills are. So you are responsible for making sure that you continue learning. And how do you do that? Well, one thing is don't depend on your employer. Your employer is not going to take care of your career for you. Those of us who have tried that have discovered just how really ridiculous that idea is. Now, you may work for an employer who's very good to your career. Good. Take advantage of that. That's fine. But never depend upon it because this is your career. So if your employer does not want to send you to a conference and you think it's important for you to go to that conference, go to the conference. Pay for it yourself. If, you, if your employer wants, doesn't want to send you to a training class and you think it's important for you to go to that training class, go to the training class. Pay for it yourself. Take some responsibility for your own career. How much time should you spend at this? My rule of thumb is that to keep up in this industry, probably requires about 20 hours a week. 20 hours of study, 20 hours of experiment and study and goofing around and playing around. And of course, you owe your employer about 40. So that means you're going to be doing this for about 60 hours a week. And that's just what you're going to have to do if you want to keep up in this career, in this craft. And by the way, I know some of you are sitting there thinking, I've got a life, I've got a family, I can't do that. OK, maybe you've got the wrong career. Imagine you go to a doctor. Which doctor are you going to go to? The one that puts in 40 hours at the office and then goes home and watches sports? Or the one that goes home and cracks open the books? You get sued. You need a lawyer. Which lawyer are you going to go to? The one who's sharp and on top of it and knows all the current laws? Or the guy who goes into court, does a 40-hour week, goes home? That's the kind of profession we are in. They're not laborers. We are professionals. Professionals put in time on their own career. And with that, I think I will close this talk. Thank you all for your attention. Are there any questions?